on World News Tonight. Another crisis. Mariupol is facing a potential cholera outbreak despite the continuing attacks from Russia. Global crisis. No progress at Russia-Turkey talks on Ukraine grain exports as many nations suffer with a supply shortage. Fraud summit. U.S. President Joe Biden lays out Latin America economic plan at summit mad by no shows. And a kid's cafe. South Korea booms spaces for children not just to sit and eat, but also to have fun. This is Other There in a World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News tonight. And we start off tonight's broadcast with the updates on Ukraine. According to authorities in Mariupol, the water has been contaminated by cholera. This could lead to a series of health crises in the city. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Zelensky says the war has claimed the lives of more than 31,000 Russian troops. Mariupol, a Ukrainian city now occupied by Russian forces after months of relentless bombings, is facing yet another possible crisis, cholera. An advisor to the city's mayor said Tuesday that its drinking water has been contaminated by decomposing garbage and bodies, increasing the risk of a cholera outbreak. According to the WHO, cholera is an acute disease that can kill within hours if left untreated. The same authorities say that a Russian city just across the border is preparing infectious disease units in case of a cholera outbreak. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says deaths of Russian troops has now topped 31,000. Since February 24th, Russia has been paying for this senseless war against Ukraine, with almost 300 lives of their soldiers daily. Still, the day will come for Russia when the number of losses will go beyond the permissible limit, even for Russia. During an address posted on his social media, President Zelensky said that no significant changes have been made in the last 24 hours, as fierce battles in the Donbass region continue. And as the fighting continues, former Chancellor of Germany Angela Merkel revealed her own personal opinion of the war for the first time since leaving office six months ago. This is a brutal attack, disregarding international law, for which there is no excuse. What happened, in my view, is not only unacceptable, but just a big mistake on Russia's part. As Chancellor for Germany for 16 years, Merkel had been friendly to Russia and says that she has no regrets for her diplomacy. In the meantime, as part of efforts to help Ukraine get back on its feet, the World Bank has announced that it will provide the country with 1.49 billion US dollars. The accumulated total is now beyond 4 billion. The development lender said in a statement that the new financing will be used to pay wages for governmental and social workers. Russian forces control most of the strategic Ukrainian city of Severodonetsk and are heavily shelling the twin city of Lysychansk, causing major damage, the governor of the Luhansk region said. This comes as the fighting intensifies in Ukrainian's eastern Donbass region. For these Lysychansk residents, it's time to say goodbye. Ukrainian police help evacuate people from the city, where Russian bombardment has made life unbearable. I want some peace, and we want to eat. Lysychansk and the city of Severodonetsk are the last pockets of resistance left in Luhansk. The area, along with Donetsk, make up the Donbass, a region that has become a key war aim for Moscow. Just days ago, Severodonetsk appeared close to being captured by Russian forces, but Ukrainian authorities claim their troops are holding out. The regional governor, Sergei Haidai, vows there will be no surrender, but Ukrainian troops are considering a tactical retreat from the city, which Haidai says is being shelled 24 hours a day by Russian forces. That's Severodonetsk, where there are now fierce battles. They're shelling Lysychansk here from all their positions over there. It's way too dangerous to be here. Over in the north of the country, several people were killed and a dozen were injured in Kharkiv after Russia launched shelling on the region. Moscow says it was targeting an armor repair plant near Kharkiv. Ukrainian officials haven't confirmed if such a plant was hit. Instead, it says it was homes, a supermarket and other local facilities that bore the brunt of the attack. 
It's crimes like this that President Zelensky wants Moscow to be held accountable for. Next week, we plan to launch a special book of executioners, an information system that collects confirmed data on war crimes and war criminals from the Russian army. Ukrainian prosecutors claim they have recorded more than 12,000 alleged war crimes since the start of Russia's invasion. Russia and Turkey made little headway in talks aimed at securing safe passage for Ukrainian grain exports as a Russian sea blockade triggered new warnings of deadly famine. It's a race to free Ukraine's stranded grain. In the face of a global food crisis, Turkey wants to play the role of mediator to help free the some 30 million tons of grain that are stuck in Ukrainian silos. <laughs> We can set up a mechanism, a collaboration between Ukraine, Russia and Turkey to implement this plan. Turkey believes that this plan is feasible. The Turkish foreign minister and his Russian counterpart met in Ankara on Wednesday as the United Nations calls for safe corridors to enable Kyiv's grain to be shipped from key ports still under its control, including Odessa. Turkey effectively controls who enters and exits the Black Sea, giving it a unique maritime power. They've criticized Russia's invasion and offered to help Ukraine demine its coast. But Kyiv is concerned it could leave Odessa and other key ports open to a Russian attack, which Moscow denied it would do. We are ready to guarantee the safety of ships leaving Ukrainian ports, and we will do so in cooperation with our Turkish colleagues. Russia wants sanctions lifted as part of a deal to end the blockade, which Turkey said was a legitimate demand. The country would need Moscow's support if they carry out a new operation against the Kurdistan Workers' Party forces in northern Syria, which the two leaders also discussed on Wednesday. With Mariupol now under Russian control, the vast majority of Ukrainian grain is stuck in Odessa. The United Nations is concerned that Russia's blockade could force millions of people into famine due to rising costs, particularly in Africa, where prices have already risen over 20 percent. Sudanese farmers are struggling to fund new crops as the government has failed to buy their harvest under promised terms. The Ukrainian war has further complicated the country's food grain outlook, driving prices for inputs such as fertilizer and fuel to new highs. It should be a busy planting season on the plains of Sudan's Gazira scheme. But farmers here are standing idle in a country stalked by rising hunger. They say they don't have the money to fund any new crops. Nasser Abdallah's wheat should have been sold months ago, but it's still sitting in storage. He took out loans assuming the government would buy it, but now he's worried that if his crop spoils, he won't be able to pay it back. The finance ministry did not comment directly on the wheat purchases, but in a statement said it had committed to buying $300 million worth of wheat and sorghum, adding that it was trying to get money from the central bank. The cost of farmers' fuel rose more than 6,500 percent in 2021 compared to the year before, the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization said. It added that erratic rain, pests, conflict and irrigation issues knocked out more than a third of this year's production of wheat, sorghum and millet. Making the situation worse is the rise in fuel prices driven by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Sudan's military leadership has said it is addressing the issue, but farmers criticized a recent purchasing announcement as having prohibitive conditions. U.S. President Joe Biden announced a proposed new U.S. economic partnership with Latin America aimed at countering China's growing clout as he kicked off a regional summit mared by discord and snubs over the guest list. A chance for cross-continental unity and a renewed call to prove the dividends of democracy. That was the message delivered by U.S. President Joe Biden to leaders at Wednesday's Summit of the Americas in Los Angeles. As we meet again today in a moment when democracy is under assault around the world, let us unite again and renew our conviction that democracy is not only the defining feature of American histories, but the essential ingredient to America's futures. The lineup of visiting heads at the summit was, however, made conspicuous by its absentees. Cuba, Venezuela and Nicaragua were excluded from participation, leading Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador and several other leaders to stay away in protest. As it was, 
Biden used the opportunity to call for a re-strengthening of supply chains hit hard by the pandemic, as well as presenting Latin American countries with a viable economic alternative to China. First, the American partnership will help economies grow from the bottom up and the middle out, not the top down. Second, the America's partnership will foster innovation and help governments deliver for their own people. Third, the American partnership will tackle the climate crisis head on with the same mentality we're bringing to the work in the United States. Biden also used the opportunity to preview a summit declaration on migration set to be rolled out on Friday. However, without the leaders of Guatemala and Honduras, two countries that send the most migrants to the U.S., its credibility has been called into question. Up next for the U.S. president, though, is a meeting with counterpart Jair Bolsonaro on Thursday, with climate change and October's election in Brazil on the agenda. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, the current monkeypox outbreak has now seen more than 1,000 cases in 29 non-endemic countries. The head of the World Health Organization has said that monkeypox is becoming a real risk. A total of more than 1,000 cases of monkeypox have now been reported outside the West and Central African countries where the disease is endemic. The World Health Organization on Wednesday said the disease has spread to 29 non-endemic countries. None of them have reported any deaths. The risk of monkeypox becoming established in non-endemic countries is real. The WHO chief said that he's particularly worried about high-risk groups. He added that some countries are seeing community infections. But monkeypox isn't a new disease. It's been around for decades in Africa. The WHO said that it's important to remember so far this year that Africa saw more than 1,400 cases and 66 deaths. It's an unfortunate reflection of the world we live in that the international community is only now paying attention to monkeypox because it has appeared in high-income countries. Brazil could become the 30th non-endemic country to report a case. According to Reuters, it is also awaiting test results of a suspected case. Health officials in Brazil said the patient, a man in his 40s, had recently traveled to Spain and Portugal. He's been displaying symptoms since late last month and is currently in isolation. The WHO technical lead for monkeypox said that the disease is spread through close interpersonal contact. And as of right now, According to WHO, the window of opportunity is still open to prevent the further spread of monkeypox, especially among those who are most vulnerable. Former U.S. President Donald Trump's action on the day of the January 6th Capitol riot will be a backdrop when the House Committee investigating the attack hold a primetime hearing and will present new evidence. In the year since the House Select Committee began its investigation into the deadly January 6th assault on the Capitol, it has conducted more than 1,000 depositions and interviews and collected over 140,000 documents. Now its findings are ready for prime time. Every conversation. The committee will hold public hearings starting Thursday evening, aiming to not only shine a light on the unprecedented attempt to subvert U.S. democracy, but to draw a line of responsibility directly to the White House. Yes, the committee has found evidence of concerted planning uh, and premeditated activity. Committee member Representative Jamie Raskin has called the attack nothing less than an attempted coup and said the evidence will show that Donald Trump himself was responsible for his supporters violently trying to overturn his election defeat. Uh, the idea that all of this was just uh, a rowdy demonstration that um, spontaneously got a little bit out of control is absurd. Uh, you don't almost knock over the U.S. government by accident. I think that uh, Donald Trump and the White House were at the center of these events. That's the only way really of making sense of them all. We're going to have to fight much harder. Trump and his defenders say the former president did nothing wrong as he flirts with running for the White House again. And the Republican National Committee has called the assault, quote, legitimate political discourse. 
But with just five months to go until the November 8th midterm elections, the committee, made up of seven Democrats and two Republicans, will attempt to reverse Republican efforts to downplay or deny the violence of the day. The big task for the committee, says Democratic strategist Simon Rosenberg, is to tell their story well. I think the committee is very aware that they have an obligation just to tell the story and to make sure that the American people understand what happened to their own country. The committee has spoken privately with many in Trump's inner circle, including his daughter and son-in-law, as well as Rudy Giuliani, who is Trump's personal lawyer and spearheaded efforts to overturn the results of the 2020 election. Rosenberg said the stakes for the nation couldn't be higher. Donald Trump is you know, under suspicion of having committed the gravest crimes against our democracy in American history. And that, you know, he and his team may have, you know, betrayed our country in ways that no other set of Americans have in all in all of our history. We're going to learn a lot more about that, I think, in the coming months. The big question is, will Americans care? A Washington Post poll last month found that only 40 percent of Americans believe the committee is conducting a fair and impartial investigation. In the face of strong conservative opposition, European Parliament lawmakers narrowly voted to back a European Commission proposal for a total ban on new CO2 emitting vehicles by 2035. Europe's green transition has moved into the fast lane, and this could be the future of the European auto industry, 100% electric. After weeks of debate, MEPs voted in favour of a ban on sales of petrol, diesel and hybrid cars from 2035. If we want to respond to climate change, we have to use cars that don't pollute or emit carbon. This is a historic decision by the European Parliament. We're the first to do so and we're proud. But many French people may not be ready for the change. Here, like in all rural areas of the country, the car is a vital and often only practical form of transport, and locals aren't totally on board with the new ban. The proposed law comes as the EU plans to slash greenhouse gas emissions in the coming years in a bid to avert catastrophic climate change. Cars account for around 12% of the continent's emissions. But some fear the ban could backfire if new electric vehicles are too expensive. One worry is that if in 2035 the electric vehicle is still more expensive than traditional cars, people may prefer not to buy new. So they'll keep their old polluting cars for longer or maybe even rent another combustion engine car, meaning we won't reach the objectives. EU member states have yet to greenlight the proposed ban, but it's expected that they will go ahead with the measure. A state-run economic think tank says South Korea's economic recovery is losing stem due to global supply chain disruptions and soaring prices. However, the report says the service industry is picking up, providing a glimmer of hope. It seems there's a difficult road ahead for the local economy. South Korea's economic think tank, the Korea Development Institute, published a report on Thursday. It pointed to global supply chain disruptions and rising raw material prices for hindering not only the manufacturing industry, but the Korean economy as a whole. Growing inflationary pressure on the supply side also made consumer prices shoot up. May's headline inflation stood at 5.4 percent, up from 4.8 percent in April. Core inflation, excluding food and energy, was also higher in May at 3.4 percent compared to 3.1 percent the month before. But some good news came from the service industry. Thanks to ease to social distancing measures, face-to-face -face businesses have been showing signs of recovery. In fact, service production recorded another month of high growth, jumping from 3.7 percent in March to 5.1 percent in April. However, exports, which did improve in May from the previous month, showed signs of slowing. Much of that had to do with China's zero-COVID policy and other external uncertainties. With that, the KDI says the domestic economy should keep a close eye on the war in Ukraine and other countries tightening monetary policies. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Iran said it disconnected some International Atomic Energy Agency cameras monitoring its nuclear sites hours before the UN nuclear watchdog adopted a resolution criticizing the Islamic Republic for failing to cooperate.
Britain's Duchess of Cambridge visited a children's charity in London where she helped pick out clothes and equipment for the beneficiary families. Nigeria's ruling All Progressive Congress has picked former Lagos State Governor Bola Timubu, describing by some as a godfather figure, as its candidate for the presidential election in 2023. A fire broke out at a lawyer's office in the South Korean city of Daegu, leaving at least seven people dead and about 40 injured. Grain prices in Afghanistan have kept soaring due to the sanctions imposed by the United States and the ongoing conflict between Russia and Ukraine, adding to the aggravated humanitarian crisis suffered by the Afghan people. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed to watch any of the stories we air tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight with children enjoying their time at a South Korean cafe for kids. Stay safe and have a good night.